Um, I've uh, known the owner of the property quite a while. He's actually considering the plan, but uh, a couple weeks ago we received a, a letter from from him and a photo you know, of a plan to uh, close the courts. And um, talking with him, apparently this is, this is when something he's been contemplating for a while, and some folks have known about it, and but this is the first we've learned about it. And uh, um, I guess why I wanted to I call up uh, the clerk and said, has this been, does the council know about this? And has it been discussed at all? And uh, the impacts of it, and, uh, and she mentioned the, I guess it's been a year or so ago, there was a uh, attempt to rezone some property over there. I said, no, that wasn't me. I know about that. It's from um, a country wood. I think they were wanting, he's wanting to build some of the houses there. And uh, I wouldn't, and from what I heard, I, uh, they, 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 folks have, they were not happy about that. And, uh, and that was stopped. But um, talking with, uh, and I think they have a lot of folks know Mr. Myers. He's a great guy. And uh, um, he's, he's in predicament with this golf course of what I've talked to him and he's been going for a while now losing money um, for various you know, for reasons and and so he's he can't I guess continue the way things are going. And so he I felt this, this was his only option. He's else he's already consulted realtors about it. Um, like I said he has got this preliminary little layout, nothing designed or anything like that. But um, I wanted to discuss it with the council, because um, I mean, I, my my property backs up against it, so I do have a a play in this, you know, and I have reason to bring this forward. And um, was one of the reasons I I bought the property was was it was on it was a golf course slot, and uh, and I guess from what I'm looking at, I guess all of, you know all these all the adjoining properties were built after the golf course. It was there. I think it was 52 was built. Um, and uh, so it's been part of Perry a long time, and uh, and I always, whenever I get on a little Google map, I say, like, go look find my property, bam, there's a little golf course, you can see that rest right there in the middle of town, and it's a beautiful piece of property, but, yes, I think it's more than just a golf course, I think. Um, I look out there, and was in the evening, I see folks out there with the kids, and it's like, it comes kind of like a park, you know, just kind of stroke through, walk out, see people take wedding pictures out there, it's just, it's just pretty, and, um, you know, he, he is, he's, a part of the letter, he's offering adjoining owners to buy property, have first dibs of getting a piece of property if they want to, um, but, and so he even told me that the, the owner across the other side of me, I'm like a little corner of the southwest corner, she's already expressed interest if even that was a route that that's what happened. She would want because she wants, she likes this like this. That's like, we like this like this. Um, this corn down here, like this little park, this little trail, puts a cart path, but it's like a little trail and just pretty. And the reason I bring it up is what, you know, the city, um, what they if there's any kind of precedent for any kind of anything that can be done to assist him or to keep it in, um, uh, in business or the city, some kind of intervention. And matter of fact, my my wife spoke to someone who worked for Martin. He said something to the effect he'd need like a hundred uh, memberships to keep it open, something like that. Well, and I'm talking with Marty. He says, when I, uh, this is when he gave me the copy there. Um, since he bought the, I think it was 20, he bought the property in 2015. He said. He, and at that time, that actually, it gained value as property, and then it's actually dropped in this past year. But he said when he bought the property, the whole that whole surrounding um, residential areas, residential, he only had six members in all that area. And since he's had the property, he's gone up to twelve. That's all that those are, that's all the membership he has from that whole section of area right there, and. Uh, and so he says it's not generating enough revenue to keep it up. Um, but I, I wanted to, you know, see first of all if the council's aware of this, and um, it's not to me just a, you know, kind of a landowner, because I, I work for well, I've been, I work for a engineer, and we do subdivision development, and we develop properties, and I see this, and 
Um, I've actually discussed this with my boss, and he's saying that um, right now uh, there's not a big demand for new built houses because there's actually quite a few um, subdivisions that are have a lot of lots waiting to be sold. There's empty lot of empty, empty lots. Um, so if you know this were to go forward, there's no telling how long it would actually before it actually got all built. You know, it could be quite a year to me. Um, and, and I don't know what kind of maintenance or how that would work. And it just, it just, it's uh, upsetting. You know, it's upsetting to, you know, you know, the nice as it is back there and, and all that uh, property. You know, I know, I've already heard folks are, some folks are already up and on about it because they've heard, I think it's across the other side, close to the clubhouse. But um, I know there's a lot of problems. I haven't, of course, gone door to door or anything like that. Um, but I know that it, there is a lot of, a lot of that folks about this. And, uh, so I just wanted to first of all you know, bring and mention see if it's been mentioned and um, from what from uh, discussion I think some folks already have heard about this happening. So um, this, this, this is uh, something that the city has any concern about or anything they could do or you know, I know it's kind of obvious that someone who owns the property is zoned for residential. And um, but uh, I think it impacts the city so much. I appreciate the information, Mr. Tucker. I can tell you that three or so years ago, I might be a little off on that. Um, maybe it's a little longer than that. The um, prospect of the city buying the course before mm -hmm. Mr. Meyer bought it came before this council. And we, we looked at it and resoundingly said no. Mm -hmm. um, and it is. I can't, I'm not speaking for council, but we don't want to be in the golf course business. Mm -hmm. it, it is not, it's not a money maker. We're not in that business, and that's not the purpose of the city, mm -hmm. quite frankly. Now, it does affect the city just as much as the sale of the New Prairie Hotel did uh, as, as an icon. Mm -hmm. And in fact, it's back, I understand it's coming back on the market again, from what I've been told um, from that standpoint. So although we, we have a concern, I have a concern, I'm not speaking for council, there's nothing we can do mm -hmm. uh, from that standpoint. If we are not in that business, and, and I would not, I would encourage council not to purchase the course in order to pr pr preserve it as a, uh, a golf course or anything else for that matter, because that's just not the business that we're in. Um, the property is on R1, and um, Mr. Wood, has anybody approached the city for anything concerning this yet? No, sir. Okay. So. You know as well as I do, there's a process that has to go, mm -hmm. that, that someone would have to go through, even though it's currently zoned R1, there is a pretty lengthy process to get a subdivision approved. And, and it's done every day. You, mm -hmm. you're, you're familiar with that process. And even though no one to my knowledge has come well to the city yet, it, it still can happen. But that's solely dependent upon whomever owns that property, mm -hmm. quite frankly. Um, and I, I would hate to see that golf course close. Um, but by the same token, I'm not willing to put my money into it in order to prevent it. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, I, I, and that's that's my opinion. I don't know if council was aware um, that this was, was coming up. I had heard rumors of it in the, in the last several weeks mm -hmm. from that standpoint. And I have seen that letter, and then, of course, council's had an opportunity to, to, to see that, that you had presented to us. Um, from that standpoint. Council, your thoughts. I don't think we have any interest in it, but the property has been struggling for 15 or 20 years. And, uh, the only reason I can see anyone purchasing it would be to turn it into a subdivision. The land is very valuable, but that's it. I guess I wouldn't, that was one, of course I didn't know at one time this had been thought of to discuss, um, if that was the only avenue, is something like I mentioned, uh, it's been said that perhaps if you generated enough um, interest in, you know, some interest in membership or whatever, you could it open, but. That would have to be done, that's a private thing. That's exactly, that's why I was going to I didn't know how somebody that was private mm -hmm. if, if, Owners in LA area or something, so 
that basically yeah, that's what I was looking for was the ending beyond the, the city would be a private endeavor and, that's um, right. for somebody to, to go around and um, either Marty himself or um, some others to, to see if they could do something. I know uh, at that little the corner down there that that we privately we would look at somehow to keep it as a park or in, in this house. I know some kind of create a trust or something to buy that property and leave it. As a, as, you know, I don't, you know, I would, I, don't, I just like, like to see it natural back there. I don't have, we have no in town building, but, um, and he, I, I discussed with him, but he, I think he's nice, but I just, I didn't know, I was, that's why I came to see what, um, what avenues there it could possibly be. And, 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 and I just, I mean, I just, yeah, I would be sad to see it and just, in, in, in talking with them, and I know that golf courses are, are, are struggling right now. Um, it predates House and Springs. Um, they, they've got covenants of men and fees that they're covering, and their, their course is as fine as they paid for. It's, it's kept open because of these, um, that the, uh, the folks that live there. And so, whereas if this is being private, like it is, it, it, it relies on generating this from the public. And, um, I, see, I see people playing their society now. But, uh, and so that's one of the, that opportunity to kind of find out, if, you know, as a, as a citizen, I guess, sort of, and, and an owner right next to it, um, not so much, uh, you know, almost a preserve or something like this, but been there for a long time, and uh, been nice and to keep it going. I think he wants to keep you like to keep it going too. I understand. And now my attempt here wasn't to to you know to make anything to assist him in what he's doing. And so and we got an opportunity so you know. that's why I just wanted to bring it up but appreciate you guys um, listening to what I had to say about it. Yes of course well I appreciate your interest and, and thank you and if, if that changes any we'll be glad to get in touch with you. But again it's a private enterprise. Mm -hmm. there's, there's nothing that the city's is in a position to do from that standpoint. So I guess if the owners, surrounding owners, got with him and tried to come up with something, they would know, she would try to save the course. And that, that's, a, that's up to y'all. Okay. Uh, this, you know, the, only, the only time we would play a part is if there's a change in utilization that, that if not within the R1 designation, mm -hmm. then it would have to come before planning and zoning for whatever that is, and, and we have a process for that as mm -hmm. well. So, but yes, that's that, that would be between the private owner of the course and anyone else who wishes to have a part in it. And okay. now I'll, I'll discuss it actually with him and say, hey, I think, I, I personally, like talking with my wife, I'll join it, I'll, I'll join it tomorrow, you know. I have no problem with that if it means it closes. You know, I don't play golf, I'll, you know, I dabble in it, but heck, I'll, you know, for what it takes, I, I, it would not surprise me if a fair amount of the folks around me jump right in there. And now that it's come to this. But, uh, okay. I appreciate it. Thank you, sir. Appreciate your interest. Item 3B is the Leisure Services Department. Uh, 3B1 is the FC grant application request. Mr. Dye. Thank you, Mayor. Mayor, Council, um, in your database, you received a memorandum for me and some basic uh, information on the National Fitness Campaign grant. What I'd like to do is draw your attention to a short two minute video that was not available in your packet there, and it does a really good job summarizing what this is before we discuss it further. This is why I'm here. To make this happen all across the country. Let's make world-class fitness free for everyone. Hi, I'm Amy Menage, founder of the National Fitness Campaign. The National Fitness Campaign started in 1979. Our first two fitness courses were at Stanford and San Francisco. The mayor and Wells Fargo Bank got behind the program. And over a period of 10 years, we opened fitness courts in 4,000 cities across America. We're introducing a new fitness court for the 21st century and launching a new national fitness campaign. The fitness court will allow you to use your own body weight to get a perfect workout. Our 7 movement, 7 minute system allows you to get a full body workout in just 7 minutes. 45 seconds of work at each station, followed by 15 seconds of rest. 
The system is progressive, so people at all fitness levels can use it. Easy or hard, it will work for everyone. And it's adaptable as well. You can come to the fitness court and do any workout. If you're training for a Tough Mudder, if you're running a marathon, the fitness court will work for you. You can download our mobile app, learn our routines, and take some of the fitness challenges. This will allow you to compete on the fitness court against your own personal times and against your friends. You can also match the music on your phone to your workouts to make it a lot more fun. We're joining forces with Fit Radio to build fitness courts in 100 cities and schools across America in 2018. Fit Radio provides $10,000 for every $20,000 we raise. Each time we do this, we open a new fitness court. Our first new fitness court has been at Marina Green for more than three years now. Tens of thousands of people have used it, and hundreds of people from around the country and around the world have contacted us to get one. I think it's amazing. I love the fact that this is here and it's been here. It's awesome. You can go to kind of workouts here. National Fitness Campaign is a social enterprise and I take no salary. So all the money we raise goes directly to building fitness courts across America. We envision fitness courts joining basketball courts and tennis courts as essential elements of healthy infrastructure in cities and schools. Brookside is work with you to build fit communities. Join with us and let's make world class fitness free for everyone. Now, it's not the director's intent to make everybody feel bad for Thanksgiving. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, from that, you can kind of see what these, you know, what a fitness court is. Um, Nancy's going to pull up a, there we go, okay. Uh, in working with uh, council members Byron, Grace, and King, uh, I was looking at several different sites. Um, we had three, and I was thinking of our of our major parks. But Creekwood is the best fit for this kind of, of a court, simply because the old tennis court that circled there is still in good enough shape and has a good foundation. I also like the fact that there's a trailhead directly coming out at Creekwood. So if I were a workout enthusiast, I want to do the cardio portion, I go for my workout there, straight to the trail. And that's the portion that's being paved right now that would end at the bottom of the hill. So basically you'd have a 300 yard run down the embankment to get there. But uh, with the splash pad, the picnic shelter, the playground renovations that we're planning on doing, this is our major sports park. We have football, softball, a lot going on there. It just all fits. It's all right there in that single apartment, okay? That's the good part. Now, I talked to uh, the National Fitness Campaign, had a, had a couple of conference calls with them. I sent them this same information that you're seeing here, a little bit more detailed. And uh, for this year, they've got 20 slots left. They're trying to do 100, so they feel the 80. They're very enthused about what our vision is as far as lead services, quality of life, what we're doing there. Uh, but I did not want to go any further before uh, giving it to, to council. Um, when the, that little quick slide that showed the funding mechanism for about three seconds, uh, in your board pack, there is a more descriptive sheet about how this actually works. At a bare minimum, you're talking about a city investment of $60,000. Okay? That, uh, 80,000 to 90,000 is with them helping raise more money through the corporations here. That's what they would do. It would not be me or you going out and doing that. Okay? Um, but still, there's no formula to predict that. You know, we have companies and stuff around here. That part, to me, I would rather, if this was something that you're interested in, I would rather say, okay, you're looking at an $80,000 investment. And if we get a little Christmas money, great. That's awesome. Um, the other part is that national sponsor covers ten thousand. Um, you know these things. That's a hundred thousand dollar project. So that's it in the nutshell. It's not free, and it's not one of these grant gifts because it's it is when when we receive the email, myself and Miss Byron Grace, it comes to you as a grant opportunity. Now that's. It is, but it's a privatized brand. It's not like our RTP that we've gotten. It's not like the things that you've done in the past. Um, this is more of a, like what like the gentleman said, this is more of a movement, kind of like the boom. I heard the boom playground for a time, one of those. Um, 
it's it's one of those things that that it it would fit and it would be another jewel in the crown, so to speak. But like I said, I don't I don't want to mislead anyone in thinking that this is just one of those free grants. It's not. There's there's a substantial amount of capital involved, and that's what I want to before you talk about discuss before I go any further. Put in time. Are there any ongoing fees back to this organization? No, no. Once once you do the, this, you're done. It's not a it's not a deal where each year we've got to pay them to keep our registry and all that stuff. It's it's a it's a one time project. Now we would now maintenance and all that stuff. That's up to us. That's up to us. Yeah. You have to take care of. It. You know, this is bad to say, but I always enjoy watching these commercials because they didn't have any fat people on there. <laughs> I know. <laughs> but they may need to hire me to make the commercial. <laughs> well, and, and one of my concerns, and we talked about it before we discussed it, was I did not want, when I say me, I, I, I did not want to advise council to get in the business of competing with the fitness industry. We've got four local fitness company, of pri uh, businesses, small businesses, that, that offer a service, but that's not what, this is not weights, this is not cardio, this is outdoor calisthenics kind of stuff that, uh, well, you know, know, is a different job. A number of years ago, you may remember seeing the, the trails. Yes. The, 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 yeah. And you have these stations <laughs> at each trail. I do. You got the base. And that, 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 that's been going on for the last 30 something right. years. Right. Um, and this is a, just a new take on that, except it's in one spot. Exactly. Right. Um, exactly. So, and, uh, it, I, I don't know how. Well, I guess it could be considered competing, but I, I wouldn't consider it. No, but I would not. It, none of this is movable except for no. the except for the chain hook things that you hang on to. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. on that, that's, council, what do you think? Well, you know, it's, it's my interest uh, initially came to me, and since we, since you became mayor of this wonderful city, you started a meeting with um, walking with the mayor and council. That's a form of exercise, and I think that would just be an addition to uh, what we already have started. Once a quarter, we're going to have to go to this court <laughs> in the place of the Walton Mayor and Council. Now, that you. is something you need to get on film. That's not to me. <laughs> you sure you still want it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> She'll play the brain today. She'll be a supervisor. She got to be leading the front. She got to be out there. She got to be leading. I didn't mean to interrupt. Go That's all right. <laughs> but, uh, Looking at, like Kevin, looking at the areas that that we could possibly put it in, I thought that was the best because of the fact that uh, tennis court was no longer usable and that we do have so many sports activities going on out there. And when we put in the, the new equipment for the kids, that would be one thing that moms or dads right. could possibly use while the kids were playing in the splash pad. Right. So it was desirable to me for that reason. Yeah, me too. I mean, it's like, yeah, I'm, me I'm, too. I'm, I'm a recreator. I'm great at spending money to make, to make fun stuff. I mean, so, I, of course, I, and I like this, but, you know, we've got a lot going on. So, we've got a lot going on. Anybody else? Is this something that they are doing every year? Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. They have for this past, for the past 10 years, since their existence. I like the concept, I like the idea. With everything else we got going on park wise, would we be better off to get some of that accomplished, get some synergy going and plan on this a year or two down the road? Well, yeah. I know this is a lot of money, but, but if we're gonna do it, I'd rather us plan for it to be I would rather us insert it into the plan as soon as possible. And, and, but when we implement it, it's up to right, the council. What, that's what I'm talking about. Um, but the, the implementation, not necessarily 18, because you got several other projects, major things going on. Well, it could be included in part of phase two. Yeah. Pretty cool. But we need to make a provision for it if, if we decide to do something. I think that's a good concept that we can come to. Like you said, if we, always, we need to get it in the plan, not wait and plan it later on, but we, we can work it we work it in the plan as we're doing it. We've got other things that we've got on the table. As we finish one project, we move to another one. And I think that would be a good thing. You know, to, 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 to,
since we got a lot going on, it, it would. And like you said, he'll stay to it what's going on. And it's also a little bit, I think, to give them, to get the new road cleared in, that would really enhance all that, isn't it? That would be a plus. But you got to say. Oh, well, I have to say? Yes, sir. <laughs> well, number one, you can say you'd like to put in your capital plan, but normal with these type of things, if you go and apply for this year, then they're expecting you're going to get started, you're going to go this year, right, right. or whatever the next year is. <clears throat> and as far as I can tell, if we get some other corporation assistance there, that's fine, but I'm figuring we got to start, start at 80K. Plus, you also know something, it's 80K plus the installation going in there. And, and Mr. What's his name graciously gives 10, you know, for this. Uh, we hit, just like you all have talked about, we have three major projects talking about coming to Creekwood Park. The first one is the splash pad, the second one is the new playground. Destination playground equipment, and the third, like we talked about, is the new access road. From my perspective, unless you want to take the money, but if you if you go with it, then the money has to come from general fund or it has to come from swaps. If it comes from general fund, then something else in general fund is not going to be funded. But normally we don't do that. If you take it from swaps, then some other recreation project gets postponed and delayed. And that could be the destination playground. You see what I mean? It could be you know, those type of things. I think it would be much more prudent from the manager's standpoint that you take it under advisement, kind of following up on William's thing, and then when you get a little further along, I'm not saying until all those projects are done, but for example, once we have the splash pad done, then maybe go back and check and see you know, where we are with that. Sounds good. I, I can. I can accept that because I would like to see all the little things done too, but eventually I would really like to see that done too. Yeah, I mean, concept is something to add there. I think y'all have talked about it would be a very good idea. Mm -hmm. But uh, just like Mr. King said, I think it'd be a very good idea after that new access drive is put in. We have improvement too. We have other parts that might want some money. Yes, that's right. Uh, and we've got stuff going on that other part. That other part is not taken from other parts. And I can, I mean, I'll happily keep, I had a great meeting with these folks. I'll keep the communication lines up. They know, they, they've got their information for me, I've got theirs, so it's not like if we choose to not go now, we can't revisit. But it, the, the, the manager's correct. Right? Right. They expect, if you go for it, no. they want it done now. That's right. Not putting down the road. We'll accept it under advisement and put it in the concept plan for, for future development. Yes, sir. How about Absolutely. That, mm -hmm. that work? Yeah, pretty done. Thank you, Thank sir. You. Item C is under administration. C1 is considered transporting animals from the Perry Animal Shelter. Mr. Gilmore. Thank you, Mayor. <coughs> Mayor and Council, in your board pack, you have a memo from me dated November 15th. Talking about an issue that has been discussed, there may or may not be people here. Uh, tomorrow meeting to talk about this aspect, but on the adoption process and the transporting of animals that are under the, our care. Uh, you may remember with the amended animal retention policy for the first seven days are city animals and we just hold on to them and after that they are available to be adopted and whoever wants to adopt them would have to come and get them. Uh, in the past, there's been a, uh, a good collaboration between FOPAS, for example, and the city where the animals would be taken to PetSmart, um, or they'd be taken to the vet to be uh, prepared for adoption. Um, the administration's recommendation to you would be that we could uh, have that process still continue subject to uh, that the organization is the responsible party for the animals and will be liable for any issues that may develop when they have the animals in their care. The second is that the organization agrees to hold the city harmless for many of its agents' actions. And three, that it would be responsible for all transportation. In other words, the group <coughs> come, get the animal, take it, or whatever they're going to do. 
And if we're talking about the medical transport, then that organization is solely responsible for those medical costs, which you may remember we've talked about you know, before. Uh, if we can get an agreement with that, for example, with FOPAs, then I think that that would be doable. Currently, or what has historically been used, is an agreement, and all the agreement says is that the FOPAs agents won't sue the city you know, for the transport of the animal. So therefore, we would still have the liability since they're our animal if something happens. You know, for example, take the animal over to PetSmart, something uh, Irritates the animal, whatever the animal takes off, bites somebody, you know, all that kind of stuff. That liability would come back to us as it stands right now if we were to do that. Uh, the other thing that you have said with the policy, which I think is absolutely correct, is that, that the city of Perry strongly supports adoption, but it is not in the adoption business. Um, so if you all would be interested in this, we could prepare your general agreement get it back to whatever interested groups are and then see what happens. Or if you don't want to get into it all, then we will advise whoever may ask. We do need to, to a point. I know I understand what you're saying, but uh, it's a city of I think I think it would be a good gesture from the city to say, yes, we will allow this to participate subject to the agreement. So then if the organization is a legal organization, okay, um, or I guess potentially even an individual, and they sign the agreement, they abide by those type of conditions, then we're covered and that'd be fine. Uh, if there isn't anyone who is interested in doing that, you all have made that effort, but you still protected the taxpayer's interest. Make, 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 make sense. Fine. Fine. The consensus is to move forward under these conditions. Okay. Um, 3C2. City employees on boards, etc. Mr. Gilmore. Thank you, Mayor. Mayor and Council, in your board pack is a memo from me talking about a uh, topic that has not come up before. I'm not aware necessarily whether there's anything right now with that either, but reviewing our personnel policy, it does not say anything relative to city employees participating or being on any of the either joint or sole <coughs> uh, mayor council appointed boards. For example, the planning commission or the airport authority or some organization like that. Uh, but it could be something that comes up, so always trying to be proactive from the administration's standpoint. Uh, we would like to get some type of determination from you if you would be interested in doing that. If you would, I have a couple things uh, to point out. First one is, would the employee be qualified to serve based on residency, education, etc.? In other words, if you're, just because you're an employee, could you be considered to be appointed? Okay? And that could be a problem, for example, on the planning commission, if we require residency in the planning commission. Second, is there a conflict between the employee's job or career track and the organization's function? In other words, you could have an employee, if you decide to do this, that is appointed to that, initially their job has no conflict with the board they're on. And they go through the career track, and then you wind up. Everybody with me? People having a potential problem there. The other big item would be how would you address selection if a number of employees are interested? You want to serve. Um, is there a conflict for serving and the city having to pay the employees' rate when serving? Some of y'all may remember this is an issue we had to go back with the IRS open recreation. You know that if it's a city employee and if there's some type of city related function, then we may have to pay them. So that could, in other words, translate into overtime to pay the employee, plus the other members, uh, for example, if it's on the public facilities authority, they serve without pay. And if you have an employee on there, then the employee would be making money. Uh, probably, at least from my perspective, the most important point on that would be what would be the citizens or uh, respective benefits of the authorities, respective of councils appointing city employees placed on these governing boards. 
I think that's a very major issue that you need to take into account. Um, I would, you want to try and avoid, I would think, stacking any of these groups with employees, well, how far did you go? Or could there be concerns from the, you know, the people that are served or whatever about doing that? And then also, could the appointment cause a conflict between employees? Uh, well, you know, I wasn't, so, you know, going back, how you make this up? Well, I wasn't selected because everybody went in and uh, you just go through. Some, some of the boards we have, for example, do have certain type of criteria or expectations. Others are oriented just to have <coughs> citizen input, and primarily citizens from the cities to input to guide you, provide you advice on these structures. Do we have a policy at home? Can it be, I just want to create, just for, like here now, the action equipment, can city and probably be on the board? So, have we had city employment board before? No. Okay. Are we going to create a policy? I just want you acting up. Do you want to create a policy at this point to allow city employment to go on certain board if they qualify? Well, I'm, I'm bringing it up. Okay. Okay. The manager's recommendation is no. You know, for the reasons that are laid no. out here. You, okay. don't, you don't do that. Because I think that it's not that there would be anything wrong with a particular employee's skills. I mean, that could be a very fine, perfect person. But, as I've laid out here, there are too many other issues, I think, that can cause you problems as time goes on. Uh, you know, for example, well, I wasn't selected because I was an Eskimo woman. Are you? You know, well, yes you are. But no, you weren't selected because we felt that, you know, this other woman was more qualified. Well, yeah, but that other woman also as an employee lives outside the city, and I'm a city resident. See what I mean? And you just have, uh, you know, I think just all kinds of you know, problems with that. The other deal is about the pay. You know, issue, that can be a real the pay problem. issue is, is significant. Mm -hmm. Because we'll lose any challenge if we did have, yeah. well, well, first of all, the, the, to be qualified to serve on these boards, authorities, and commissions, each board, authority, commission has its own qualified right. things. So if we had someone who fell into those categories and already well, that's not our decision anyway. Well, for the most part. But but being a city employee and then getting appointed by the same body to serve on anything <laughs> is gonna is gonna constitute part of their duties. Um and I think now that that's a legal issue, Mr. Holman. I don't want to put words in your mouth, but we would lose a challenge if we tried not to pay them. For, the, for that if it came up, I think. I've seen it happen in other organizations who have lost. So I, I think that's as major an issue as anything else. And this has nothing to do with the employees, but the, about their, their caliber or their qualifications or even their desire to serve. Um, but I think it would be a mistake if we, were, if we didn't have a policy prohibiting it. Okay. For, for a, a lot of various reasons. Uh, none the least of which is, is, is some could be legal. Now, not in every case uh, from, from that standpoint, but I, I think Mr. Gilmore brings up a, uh, some yeah. good points. Yeah. And I'm going to be with him. I don't think we need to go. But he'll create a lot of problems. We probably did and gone. And he'll create all <laughs> kinds of problems. And then we'll be going to start at something that I think we don't need it. That's my opinion. I don't think we need to go that way. Well, and, and you need to remember that. Anybody can challenge well, the policy. Is that right? Oh, and then it'll be up to council on a need to, need to mm -hmm. as needed basis. But, but for the most part, I, I think it would behoove us to come up with something. On this. Something for it. Not having a something for it. Not to get a policy to have it. Not. We need a policy that addresses. Not that. That says no. That oh, says no. Okay. Yeah. I'm going to be no doubt. 100%. <laughs> I'm, trying to, I'm trying to avoid having a negative policy. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't know how to say it. But, but you're right, because we, we'll get challenged. Yeah. If we get challenged, they, they think we take it out. No, no, you know no. what I mean? And, and that's not what we want, you know what I mean? Okay, I'm going to meet you. What I'll do then is we'll prepare something for you for tomorrow's meeting. You know, it's a resolution that just says it's perfect. Mr. Hunt, I'm full agreement. They don't need to go. <laughs> 
Anything further? No, sir. Thank you. Item 3C3 is the 2018 council calendar. Um, <coughs> trying to remember now, since this is me, we need to address uh, the, the 2018 calendar. Um, and, and by that, I mean several, there are several Monday holidays that we typically don't meet on work sessions, etc. Uh, and then you get into um, the, the, looking at the calendar year, and then we have a, another fiscal year. What happens like the week of Thanksgiving that, that we're in right now? And we, of course, we, we're going to meet. And there's, unless there's a <coughs> viable reason not to, then, then I fully intend on, I think we ought to have a meeting. But we need to look at the calendar to see if there's going to be any conflicts. But the calendar year 2018, and that's the, the reason it's on here. And the reason it's on here is what I'd like to be able to do is to make sure you bring your calendars to the next work session so that we can have this discussion and, and see, you know, when the dates fall and, and, and if there are, and I haven't, I haven't looked just to make sure there's not any potential conflicts in 2018. Yes. So, but but that, that's why it's on here. I, I think it would behoove us to spend a few minutes to look at the calendar. For the whole year. Sometimes yeah. even GMA has followed. Right. Yeah. And, and we'll do our best to get those dates as well of what we already know is going to happen in 2018 just to make sure that um, I think we'll look at that. Ain't no way we can get it. <laughs> Next work session. Thank you. Item 3C4 is a discussion of the Period Housing Authority appointment. Um, you've got. Um, the, the memo here, and I've asked Ms. Warren to put on the agenda, and you'll see it on there tomorrow night, and just to, to have a note that it's just going to appear on the agenda until it's filled uh, from that standpoint. But um, we, we do need to uh, look at a, a replacement for Mr. Wolf, who has resigned uh, as of the end of the year. Um, and I think we had talked about this earlier. If y'all have any, any suggestions, there, there I have spoken to. Mr. Um, Beckham, Ed Beckham. I could see his place, I couldn't call his name. It's one of those age things. Um, last week, and, and he had uh, wanted to know if, if council had any uh, people that they were uh, interested in serving. They have someone in mind uh, from, from that standpoint, but they wanted to uh, see if anybody had anybody else. If that makes any sense. So if the, the reason's on there, if you have someone, in mind, please let me know in the next couple of days so we can go ahead and get this appointment. Um, we have some time um, in the next week or so. So, you know, they got somebody, they have someone in mind, okay. yes, they, they do. But, but by the same token, if, if there's a member of council who has someone else in mind that wishes to serve and is qualified, um, then we need to make sure we do it. Okay, if you have any questions about that, please call me. 3C5. Is the Walton Mayor Council in District 2 on November the 28th? Um, you may see that we have already, you've already received information about a District 2 town hall meeting that was scheduled for January the 30th at 5.30 p.m. at Mount Arthur Elementary School. And that was done, my understanding is that because that's the time that we can get in the school uh, from, from that standpoint. So that was, uh, this, this is, I think it's District 2's turn. For the, for the month of November. Um, so what I would li like to let you know is that um, we're going to have a District 2 walk anyway. And we'll have to adjust the schedule accordingly. It's going to be in, in um, Lake Forest Subdivision on November 28th at 5.30. Okay? Any questions? That's going to look a little odd because we're going to have District 2 and then again in January, and that's going to throw the system off a little bit. We'll, we'll just adjust it as, as necessary. But I wanted to tell you why um, that, that was done that way. Okay. Did you drop it? I do. Uh, why are we moving this time? It's 545. Do <laughs> you want to back it up to 5? I just brought that up. So and I agree know, with you. With I, the note. I mean, you all want to back it up to five? And if we don't, we're going to finish this thing in the dark. 
I ain't got no problem with it, but you know. She's conjuring up rain or snow or something already. <laughs> or headlights. <laughs> yeah, you got to give me a flight to make that song. No, seriously, do you want to move back up to five? Uh, is that going to enter? Five. Okay. Let's, let's, we're going to have it on November 28th. If you would make a note, let's back it up to five, please, Nancy, and, and modify that. Thank you. Three C six. We have a public problems, democratic decisions by council members Bynum, Grace, and King. Well, that was me. Next one. If y'all want it next time, it can be next time. Well, we just pulled it because what what I have called for is the rest of the information from the class, and I have yeah. not received it as yet. Please postpone this until the next work session. Thank you. Yeah, that was easy. Item 3C7, amending the city's assistance program. Mr. Gilmore. Assistance. Thank you, Mayor. <coughs> Mayor and Council, we have a senior disabled financial assistance program with certain criteria. As you may remember, that uh, covers uh, pays for those persons who qualify their stormwater fee and the sanitation fee, all of which are fixed costs. Uh, going back and taking a look at it, the administration recommends to you that we also add for those persons who qualify the base fee charges for water and sewer and gas if they are a gas customer, because those are also fixed as well. You know, for the same basis on why you provided you know, waiver for the fire fee. You know, stormwater fee. We do not want to get into a deal about any credits or anything based on consumption because that becomes too much of a problem. So we're going to stay away from that. The current council to pursue that. Okay. Thank you. Item receipt eight is an update on the joint mail natural gas capital expansion. I y'all may remember that um, there was a last Wednesday was an update for joint mill natural gas. I'm going to turn off one row of these lights so we can somewhat see this. The, um, and you have this information in, in your packets. Joint mill natural gas is expanding. <coughs> it's very difficult to see. But if you look at right there is a, what's called a Bass Road Junction. And there's a red line that comes down this way all the way down and comes back up over here to what's called the Montrose Station. The, that is is um, that entire line is, is, the, is where jointly owned natural gas has for gas distribution. Y'all may remember that jointly owned natural gas is owned by the cities of Warner Robins, Cochran, Byron, Perry, Hawkinsville. They're five of us. You remember last time we did that, a little over a year, about a year and a half ago, um, we needed to borrow some money in order to do some upgrades and, and stuff, and, uh, and we have done that. What we have found now is that with the expansion of Perry and Hollingsworth and Bowes and Hawkinsville is having a major expansion, which will require more gas, and they are the number one user of gas in, in Hawkinsville. Over there in Cochran, it doesn't, um, doesn't have anybody on the drawing board right now, but they're still in this line. The majority of the gas that's used comes from Bass Road Junction up here, and it comes down, and I can't see, somewhere right in there, there's a little bitty road that, that is, uh, goes over to Softy Industrial Park in Macon. Mm -hmm. That serves Kumo Tire, and they are a major user of gas, and they're, in, they're building in phases um, from that standpoint. And then the line comes down from there to uh, the city, one Robins and, and Perry and Byron. Um, and then it makes, makes that bottom loop. 
what we have determined is that with and with the information that you have, there are numerous um, opportunities, if you will. Can you go to the next next page, please? Okay. Because of those those opportunities, just hit X, red X. Thank you. I'll leave it alone. <laughs> Let me walk over here then. How about that? I'll do it the old fashioned way, just point. Um, this is a, a, a graphical representation of, of a gas line. This is the Montrose tap, and this is called the Bass Road uh, Junction tap. The Bass Road Junction tap taps into a major um, gas line that is supplied, I think, by Tremco or Temco. It doesn't matter. This line right here is six inches. It comes down to where it shoots off and goes over to South Industrial Park. We cannot expand the can't take on any more gas in our line, in the entire line now. We have enough capacity to um, service our existing customers, which includes all five cities and then those industrial base that jointly owned also serves. The proposal is to increase the system because the city of Perry has already asked for more gas because of what we know what we've got coming with um, Sandler. Their phase two is going to come online. And you remember I've told you all before, the city of Perry's gas line comes in. Um, the, 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 uh, the regulator station is on Bear Branch Road. That's where it comes into the city. And that line is a two-inch line from Bear Branch Road, comes all the way down and loops around to the industrial park. And it serves the rest of the city as well. Um, but, but that's where it comes. It's about eight miles. And at some point, <coughs> we're going to have to increase that line in order to, to serve um, the, the industrial commercial capacity for the city of Perry when, in order to grow more. Even if we were to do that, we can't. Uh, we can't do it from jointly owned because there, there's not enough pressure coming in order to serve it. Now, the, this this is fine, and this is what's going to backfill to help Medu um, Medusa is right in here, the cement company, um, and that's the major line there, and and that comes uh, that also serves the the industrial park that's behind Pretty Chicken, y'all may remember, um, and and that's on the. House and County Industrial Development Authority's um, list to serve a major commercial and industrial prospects as they come. And Mr. Uh, Wayne James is the Executive Director of Joint Land Natural Gas. He's already looked at several different RFPs um, regarding prospects. And that comes just like everything else. They have prospects coming the whole time. But in order to, for us to, to position ourselves and us being jointly on natural gas, of which we are a part owner, there is a proposal for, a, for uh, an, a significant increase of capital expansion. It's in red. And that basically means we're going to create a brand new 8 inch line from this point all the way down to this point, and then there's another one from here to here uh, in order to handle the capacity. That will also require us to increase the um, junction at Bass Road. You may remember we talked about having to do that last time and made the determination as jointly owned that it wasn't necessary at that time, it's going to cost a million dollars. Just to, you remember we talked about that, mm -hmm. just to increase that regulator station in order to handle the gas. This is going to require it. Coming through here, I, it's I think 22 miles, maybe something like that. I forgot exactly how far it is. Part of that's going through a swamp, 3,000 feet of it. And you'll see the detail in one of these, these next slides. It's very expensive, it's $300 a foot to bore under the swamp. And these companies that do this all the time, <clears throat> there's a lot of stuff that the engineer that goes into it. And each one of these boxes is basically agreed to me, the engineer um, did this, but what, what he's done is showing what the capacity would be um, assuming we made these capital improvements. Okay? If we do this, right here, then that's going to give Toronto Oil Natural Gas the ability to handle the, the current gas needs, the future gas needs, not only for Kumu Tire, but for urban paper that's coming, 
um, and others. There are several others that you see in there that they're contemplating um, providing gas for. Now, the next slide, please. You will see here, and it's small on purpose, not really. <laughs> You've got it in your, your plan, to, and I often do this from memory because I can't read it either. The first section up there shows that uh, in, in, included the 8 inch main and the uh, purchase of materials, the pipe. Um, increase that, please. Hit the, hit the, can you hit the plus button so we can read it? Do it again. Okay. You, you can see some of that. Um, the breakdown and how expensive it is to do, and that's 11 million, what, one? 135. That's the parallel main from Bass Road to Jones Road with an 8 inch steel main. Um, and then move, and move up the page a little bit, please. And then going from Jones Road to the Houston Road with an 8 inch, that's that little bitty leg that cuts off to the right I showed you. That goes over to Softy. That's going to cost a million. Something? Million one. Million one. And then keep going up. The upgrade to the station at I 75 is, is going to be another million two. The total is 13.4. It's going to cost about $14 million, roughly, in order to do this. Let me put this in perspective. And, and, and this is what um, the way you, I guess you need to look at it. You're either in the gas business or you're not. It's just like the city of Perry being in the water business. We're spending $7.3 million um, that we just got the, the loan approved for with GFA in order to uh, install a new water treatment plant, drill two new wells, in order to ensure that we have the capacity today for our com uh, uh, residential, com commercial, and industrial customers and the capacity to grow tomorrow. It's going to last a very long time. This is a very similar to that. We really don't have a choice um, from, from this standpoint. Well, actually we do. We can decide to get out of the gas business, but we can stay in it and we stay in it. This is what's been determined that's needed in order to <coughs> grow. Now, if you assume that all five cities approve this, this is just like the last two. The city of Peary is a, a, a joint owner with the other five cities. We own 15.97%, and I sent y'all an email today from Mr. James, of jointly owned natural gas. Any obligations that we have going forward is going to be limited to 15.97%. I didn't say that right. Yeah, 15.97%. Just like the last time we did this. In this particular instance, y'all will remember that um, MGAG, or the Municipal Gas Authority of Georgia, are the people who actually provide the gas that goes in these pipes for us and 70 other cities, uh, member cities for uh, the state of Georgia. They can get the gas, but they can only get gas to go in the pipe if the, if the, if the pipe can handle it. And there's two ways to increase gas to a customer. You can either do it by volume or you can do it by pressure. We can't go any further with either one of those with our current system. Much We can't grow anymore. That's the bottom line. We just can't grow anymore. You need to remember that, that these pipelines, even though it comes through the city of Perry, the city of Perry is limited based on what our current capacity lines are and on the amount of gas that can come through that. And that's a different discussion we, we can have. We're probably a couple of years away from that. But I've been telling you we need to keep that on the, on, in mind for future developments. But back to this one. This is what we're looking at. Um, the city of Warner Robins owns 40.16%. Hawkinsville is 17.35%. Byron's 8.49%. And Cochran's 18.03%. Those are the percent ownerships, and it adds up to 100 the deal only works if everybody participates. It's the, this deal was put talk, talking about how long things have been in, in, in place. The Joint Oil Natural Gas loose partnership, if you will, was formed in the early 50s, strictly as a way to get gas to the member cities. Um, and that's when, when all of this started. Well, it has evolved into an enterprise. 
just like we have a, a water and the water sewer enterprise fund, the gas is also an enterprise for us, but we happen to be part of a larger utility called Joint Leon Natural Gas. So this enterprise serves more than just the five cities. Now, having said that, the five cities contracts for gas for our customers, residential, industrial, commercial, are, are guaranteed protected first before any of the other jointly owned enterprise, commercial, industrial, and some residential is served. Those contracts are with, through MGAG um, as they have been for years. That will continue. That will continue. MGAG has also offered uh, to jointly owned natural gas, the five cities, to for them to, uh, to offer a bond issue for 25 years. And that 25 year bond issue would be, depends on how we go, it's little, just a, right now it's a little over 3%. The cost of that bond issue is about $200,000. But one of the benefits, and a major benefit, for having MGAG issue the bond that's backed by the five cities with limited liability is that we do it one time. You may remember that when we when jointly on board that million dollars, like by the way, the, we, they borrowed $1.1 million, what, a little over a year ago, about a year ago, Mr. Gilmore? Mm -hmm. The balance of that loan is now down to just under 700000 So, and, and, it, and it doesn't affect the city's reimbursements for gas from that standpoint. You may remember that when we did that, that million dollar loan, it was for a period of, I forgot, four or five years now on, on, on the repayment. But every single year, each of the five cities has to come back to, to each of their councils or commissions and reapprove the next year's debt repayment for jointly owned to whichever bank has it. Um, and in this case, this is a notice, or, or excuse me, one of those, one of those banks. So we're going to have to do that again until that loan's paid off. Well, if we, we can go the bank route if Joint Leon decides to do that for the next 25 years, and that's really not tenable. Um, so going the bond issue would be a better route to go if we were to decide to do that. Now, you've got a couple of other pages in here. Um, go to the next slide, please. And the, the, yeah. Okay. This is intended to show you currently roughly what we're doing. Our current industrial usage is, um, shows about 774,000. Um, the daily is 2122 and the monthly is 64. The confirmed additional usage, and these are NCFs, is 2.96 million. Now that's with the advent of the, uh, the uh, additional um, loads, if you will. And then you've got the combined confirmed usage of 3.7, and then the likely of another 219, and the grand total of 3.9. Go to the next page, please. And you've got another one for, this breaks it out a different way. Uh, the anticipated capital is 14 million. The interest rate is 3.2 for 25 years. It'll cost $814,000 a year to pay it back. The repayment scenario, from, from just from Urban, is, would be enough to do it. Um, Amazon is another one that's coming, and then there's an unnamed one that's coming as well for 21. That doesn't count what we're already throwing off um, for. Doesn't count residential growth or commercial or growth. Commercial growth. Just keep keep going. These are, and you've got this in your packet. These are some some um, different opportunities that we have. The Amazon fulfillment center is a million square foot. The Byron Industrial Park um, is, is one, Hollingsworth, Hollingsworth and Close is, um, is significantly increasing their load. House and Canada Development Authority has two sites I've already talked about. The I-75 Business Park um, is, is the, the one that um, currently has FedEx, Tractor Supply, Yancey Brother, Caterpillar, you know what I'm talking about right there, um, um, uh, Sardis Church Road. Joint Leon supplies of gas there, Irving Paper Products, and then there's some more on the second page to that. Uh, Kumo Tire, uh, there's a medical waste facility, mm -hmm. RFI that's out there. The city of Perry has asked about um, increasing the di distribution to a greater pressure than we currently have. South Industrial Park um, already has uh, some more space, but there will, there, the space that's still left in Softkey is not large enough 
for another Irving Paper or Kumo Tire, but it is still space there for smaller companies to come in and we would provide the gas for them as well. And then the city of Warner Robins with the, in joint development with the authority of, of Peach County in the joint venture is looking to um, um, have some property available as well. And there's a 12th one, and I, this is an old list, and I forgot what it was. Um, William Wiggum was, was there. But at any rate, th these are some of the um, the different opportunities that we have. What I wanted to do um, is, is, and we had the MGA people, if you want to have them back down here, I can do that. But I wanted to give you an idea of, of where we are under General Leone, but we're at the, that critical crossroads um, as most systems get um, from that standpoint. Now, assuming we did this, we as the city of Perry, then, if, and also assuming that we elect to go the bond issue route, which makes more sense right now because you only do it one time and then it's in place uh, for the next 25 years. And this particular bond is, is not callable until the 10th year, which means you can't pay it off early. But we would have enough um, capital just from the existing businesses we know are coming, at least in phase one. The phase two of urban paper, uh, wouldn't, we wouldn't have to do anything else except provide more gas. We will have already put in the uh, necessary infrastructure in order to um, handle their phase two, to handle um, and anything else that might come down the road from Kimmel Tire. They have two or three, and then... And these figures don't take into account phase twos on anybody. That's They're right. just phase ones that they more than pay for. That's correct. Um, they, 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 more, they, they basically it breaks even from that standpoint. And then after year 10 on this 25-year bond, if we wanted to, and, and the, the profit, profit, the excess revenue over expenses uh, were, were there and they will be, then we can accelerate the repayment of this particular bond. Um, and that's the way it would, it would be scheduled. In any case, the city of Perry would not be liable for more than 15.97% of the total. A little over two million. So, um, now, as, as Ms. King, as far as what I am told, as far as our the city of Perry's bonding capacity, um, anytime you, you, you take on debt, then that affects the, the city's bonding capacity and our bond rating. This does not affect our cap at all. However, it will be noted in the footnotes to the uh, to our financial statements if we go through with this what our percentage is and the details of the deal as a contingent liability. And it's like everything else, the only way we would ever be called on uh, for this is if the entire system failed or, or something catastrophic happened, et cetera, et cetera. So I've given you the good, the bad, and the ugly uh, from, from that standpoint. Do you all have any questions? Uh, Mr. Jackson was there. Did I miss anything? No, and, and, and you said if anything catastrophic happened, also be aware that there are two entry points. That's right. That, that's so why if you get a breakage or something happens midway, you don't lose everything. That's the, that's why you have two two entry points. Now, I'm glad you brought that up. The Bass Junction, the Bass Road Junction at the top. You remember that of that V? Mm -hmm. Well, is the is the larger of the tap, if you will, and that's why the the, the eight inch is going up there in order to. to Backfill now. The Montrose station still has gas, um, and it's serviced by a six-inch line to Cochrane, and then it goes to four-inch coming back down to us. Um, if we really took off, then we would have to look at uh, increasing that. But it's 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 like ten miles further to come off the Montrose um, tap to do this to get the gas back where we need it. And the capacity it's not availability is not as good at Montrose station. As, as the I-75 station. Also, though, you've got the possibility you're only bringing that new 8-inch nut line down so far. Right. If something else major came on further down, you could extend that. That's true. You, you can do that. The Montrose station gets gas from Southern Natural. The Bass Road Junction gets it from a different supplier. And I'm, and I'm forgive me, it's Trimco, I think. But, but at any rate, they're the two reputable gas companies. But based on what else is on that southern natural line is why we want to go up here to the, to the north side. Um, 
either way, it will it will handle current anticipated and future growth for gas needs for the city of Paris, the other four cities, and the enterprise known as Joint Natural Gas. Questions? Here's the other deal. Because of um, commitments, if you will, in order to provide gas, John Leon needs to have this, this done pretty much as soon as possible. Um, based on the industrial needs, uh, 2019, the spring of 2019 is the target date. It'll take three months just to do the engineering work for this, and they've already started. From, from that standpoint. In order to um, provide the gas and increase the system without interruption, and by the way, there will not be an interruption in service to anybody while this is going on uh, from, from that standpoint. Have I missed anything? We, we, are, we are being asked to, to contemplate this and make a decision by mid-January or soon. From, from that standpoint. So, having said all of that, this is for, take, please take this under advisement. If you have any questions, thoughts, concerns, I'll be glad to bring, get anybody from Joint <coughs> Home or uh, MGAG um, or anybody else. Mr. Rusty Huff, you may remember, can come. Um, Mr. Chris Strippelhoff um, is with MGAG. He'll be glad to come down and explain these things in, in so much detail. Your eyes will glaze over in the first 30 seconds. But, but we have the experts there uh, in order to do that. Um, and, and make sure that not only are we protected, all of these agreements have to go through the attorneys of, of every city, just like we did last time. So we're going to make sure that uh, not only are our interests protected, but, but the, uh, um, the capacity for the provision of natural gas for the citizens of Perry and commercial industrial prospects and others will also be protected. And we, we will also participate in any excess revenues generated by this uh, to the point of our investment moving forward as well. Which will eventually happen. It will happen. That's correct. These phase two for urban paper is, is anticipated to be three to five years after completion of phase one. So it's probably going to be six -ish years or so down the road. But it's, um, it, it, like I said, once they go into phase two, there are no more capital requirements uh, for, for us to do, we'll just turn this, the, this turn the spigot on a little bit wider. This doesn't even take into account any future industrial growth that we don't know about. That right. hasn't happened yet. Correct. But if we don't do this, we're not going to be able to handle yeah. it. We'll be able to get it. There questions? Was, there was a lot of questions asked at the meeting, and I think answered well. It's, it, to me, it comes down to no way we got it. Right. That's what I'm looking so. Say that. I think there's a, a goal for us. We need to go. And my question was that I guess we need to have all the kinds of money in the bonus. Mm -hmm. okay. And I'm glad to do it again. Uh, if y'all want me to, I'm going to get with the council members who were not here for their own private lesson. So y'all won't have to sit through it. <laughs> I, mean, you, uh, I think you did, you did it very well. And let somebody else do it. We don't have to have nobody to come explain it to us. When we go. I think you did a very good job. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Gilmore, do you have anything to add? No, sir. Anybody else? Mr. Jackson, anything? Okay. Well, thank you all for your interest, and y'all can wake up now. We're done. <laughs> I do try to pay attention when I go to these meetings. All right. <laughs> Okay. <clears throat> Item 3D is the Community Development Department. 3D1 is considering an additional building inspector position. Mr. Wood. Thank you, Mayor. Mayor and Council. Um, let me say Tracy Hester is here as well to um, add his input. Um, as we talked to you about uh, during the budget cycle earlier this year, uh, we indicated that uh, we're getting close to uh, that point of uh, number of inspections and so forth where uh, we may need to come back to you to look at an additional building inspector. Um, and we're at that point. Um, the number of permits that 
uh, we continue to uh, issue. The number of inspections are increasing. Um, the time frame uh, that Mr. Bass is spending on those inspections is getting less and less. Uh, we need to be in a position to protect the public and do um, adequate inspections uh, to ensure that these houses and other properties are being uh, built correctly. Um, the time frame for uh, driving from uh, inspection, inspection to inspection is increasing, uh, therefore cutting out uh, time uh, during the day. So um, just wanted to bring that to your attention. Um, and, and Tracy may want to add some additional information, but uh, uh, we're at the point where we need to be, um, we need to be considering uh, this new position. And I'll be happy to answer any questions if you have any related to the scheduling or the actual numbers. Uh, I think you in your package you actually have what the write up that I gave Mr. Wood a month or so ago, and those numbers have changed considerably since then. So it's only gotten better as far as development's concerned. But one thing I want to ask you that uh, can you uh, you foresee that it's going to continue to increase? So that's what you're telling us, right? Yes, sir. I, I don't see um, I don't see this this pulling back. Um, we've certainly we could certainly take a look at some type of um, time frame for an inspector uh, position if we needed to. If that was a concern. Um, but uh, I mean, we're continuing. This should be the slowing down period um, for permits. And uh, I think um, Chris pulled the, those numbers today, and it's not any slower. Um, Just as a quick example, in 2014, you did 190 residential permits. 2015, 253. 2016, 256. And as of today, it's 279 year to date. So, there's already a considerable increase there uh, in the workload and the travel time, those kind of things that's written in the report. They're only going to get worse and better if we don't do something with it. And my biggest concern is certainly a public safety, life safety issue <coughs> to the inspections that we're doing. These are minimum codes that we are addressing each and every day, so anything less than that is, is a jeopardy to any business owner, homeowner, and the people that they serve. Oh, and it ultimately comes back to the city being liable for uh, not following through with this response. And that's residential growth, but commercial growth is doing the same thing. It, it, it's increasing. I did not pull that out, but that's such a small number relative to this. But yes, there is an increase to it. And of course, just as the presentation was made about the increase in gas, we're getting that in all your utilities, which is, falls under us for some portions of that for inspections as well. So again, the numbers just continue to increase. One person is just not getting it done. Now, I've, I've taken a lot of time, reviewed the way we do do our processes for inspections. We've cut, we've, we've been able to shorten that process some. I've taken on some of that duty myself while still trying to, to create some policies that will help us long run. But that, that's a temporary fix. Um, ultimately, it's going to take a, another body to do that. I think it will need it, like you were saying earlier, but you would have a we need someone to be on the ground to keep our contract to honest, you know what I mean, because don't cut no corner. Because I was since I've moved in my house, I find out that was a corner cut that right? If yes, somebody sir, been on top of it, it could eliminate that, you know what I mean? And I think it's well needed that we do have another inspector to make sure that you're to the site to see what the contract is doing and make sure that everything is according to a plan that it's going into the, the building that he's building up for the customer. For the customer, he might not know about it two or three years later when he went into a problem. And you know, so I think we need to be quiet. If I may, that's that's kind of the, the thought process I have when I do this. Right. Certainly that contractor that comes in is my first line customer, but at the end of the day it's the homeowner or the business owner right. that's having to provide a service that's really protecting the public. Right. Um, again the, the contractors are gonna fuss about some of the things that we're doing in the process. But it's all at a minimum standard, and our attempt is to just make that as a life safety, public safety issue um, that we can we can feel good about at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. and as far as the timing, uh, certainly that's that's a budget issue. But um, the sooner that we can get someone in here, 
especially as the holidays come in, if we're able to have somebody in first of the year so that we have that training time once development ramps back up, March, April kind of time frame, we'd have this person trained and ready to hit the street. Question, Council? How much would you inspect the car? Well, um, it, I guess that's kind of relative. It depends on what we go after. If we go sort of to a low-end inspector, somebody that's a trainee that, that I can just use selectively and train as we go in, certainly that number is established in the budget already. I think the low ends, high 30s, the mid guys, four, mid 40s. Mm -hmm. uh, someone of Dan's expertise and and uh, that sort of thing is going to be in the 50s. But here again, there is a need out there for this to to provide that safety factor to the community. So, which one of is your need? Uh, I, I, like 40 the, 50. I like the mid-range at this point. I don't think we need a, another Dan at this moment. I'd like to be able to train that person in, in the way I like to see it done uh, versus the way it's been done in the past. Because that's what I'm hearing from a lot of contractors. Why are we doing this? We've never done this before. Well, there, there's a reason for that. But your write-ups says the salary between 45 and 48 for an inspector one is, yes. is what you recommend. That's the mid range, yes, sir. That's my recommendation. Okay. Mr. Gilmore, is, can this be, uh, can we amend the budget and there are funds available to, to handle this before we amend the FY19 yes. budget? Yeah, I recommend you authorize it tomorrow. You open the position and go, because you have the issue about the, um, the ultimate users and all that type of stuff, but as you well know, you'll start hearing it from the builders and the contractors right off the bat when they're having the collection. Well, another, another concern, too, is depending on one person or something. Mm -hmm. yes, I think the car accident, right? Yeah. Whatever. Yeah. You know, and then you're really in trouble. And, that, and that's kind of another point that's in my write up, too, is I, I just we're putting a lot of pressure on one individual to be out there to, that the expediency he had, he's having to do some of this stuff. We're setting him up. Yeah. To, Put yourself in a position to have an accident or get hurt walking on the job because of just the speed that he has to do these. Well, we won't stretch him out. <laughs> but he's there. <laughs> no, we don't want to do that. Definitely. Council? Yes. Concurrence to move forward? Yes. For me. Let me make sure this is on the agenda for a vote tomorrow. Mr. Wade. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Wood. You have um, item two? Yes, and leading, uh, uh, building on that uh, discussion, um, in looking at uh, uh, the inspection process, uh, Trace has also been looking at uh, the permit review process. And uh, wanted to just give you um, kind of a heads up of um, some of the concerns that uh, he's been seeing with the uh, amount of information, the type of information that we've uh, in the past allowed to be submitted uh, for a permit. And uh, part of that directly results in uh, additional time in, in the inspection process. Um, so uh, what uh, Tracy has uh, we've put together, Tracy has, has kind of pulled this information based on what he's seen so far in his tenure here, is uh, us requesting of the uh, development community uh, additional items beginning January 1. We've already started putting this information out there, so it's not going to be a surprise to them. But um, Tracy sees a lot of um, issues that uh, can be addressed up front in the process before permits issue. Part, uh, rather than having to deal with it after the fact. Um, and so uh, this is a list of, of what we've been asking for, real, uh, or will be asking for, really more of a clarification of details. The, the new item that um, we're requesting is a site plan, and that doesn't have to be anything that's drawn to scale as long as we can understand it and it has dimensions on it. But essentially, um, some of the issues that we've seen is a house that was built 
uh, too close to the property line. Um, we don't know if that was approved that way or not because there's no site plan or there wasn't a site plan required. Um, if that had been an, e in an easement, we would never have caught it. So some of these things are, again, uh, a little bit more time, maybe a little more money, but I doubt that it's going to be uh, substantial uh, to get information up front so that we and the builder can understand what the requirements are and make sure that they're compliant with the codes. So um, I know that uh, the mayor had gotten a call uh, or, or had gotten a comment from one of the builders about some additional requirements. I wanted to make sure that everybody was aware uh, that these are um, taking place. And again, it's um, to, pre to prevent issues down the road that we can address up front. One other thing that's not on this list that I'll let you know about that will be coming before you um, with, the, uh, with the zoning ordinance update, but the Planning Commission uh, agreed to, uh, for them to get out of the final plan approval process and to delegate that to staff. Uh, we're the ones who are reviewing the, uh, doing all the inspections to verify that the streets and utilities and so forth are installed properly. They're really just taking our word in approving those final plans and signing them. So, um, as of January 1, assuming you adopt that ordinance, um, that will eliminate some time uh, that's currently kind of wasted waiting for a plan commission in my perspective. So, there's some give and take on both sides. And I'll be happy, and uh, Tracy will be happy to answer any questions you have about, um, about these modifications. Let me simplify this. In, in, in my mind, we go through an awful lot of uh, work, if you will, getting a subdivision approved, and they do that very well. Once that you need to remember, once that subdivision is approved, that's it. Somebody comes in, pulls a lot. I'm gonna build a lot 17 of X Y Z subdivision, and they pay their fee. They turn their plans in, and, and y'all say, yeah, that looks good, and you go on, mm -hmm. and we go out and we start. Inspector, there's nothing between the approval of the subdivision and the permit, or, or the, the, when the foundation's laid, it says, okay, they actually put the house where it's supposed to be outside of any built setback lines, and now it's supposed to show it, but that's what they're asking for is a, is a, a, a kind of a site plan from that standpoint. I can tell you two different occasions right now where a house was built and the corner of the house literally goes over the gas line coming through the subdivision and the easement the builder claims they never knew it was there and mm -hmm. the house has been there a while from that standpoint and we actually had to move it off oh, it, it, it not us but but I, I it, it happens right. it, it happens now they're not going to like it no builder is going to like anything extra that they have to do from that standpoint but because we're not asking for architectural plans and it's just a site plan like they've got back here, this will, will, this will help yeah. moving forward. Um, some significant problems, that now, and, and it doesn't take one or two, and then we got some issues right. know, from the standpoint. So I, I'm, now have I stated anything incorrect? No, that's right. That's right. perfect. In that. So as you understand, I've only been here five months, and I've caught two that can be major, major costs to the city if, if it had been constructed on our easements or our utilities in some cases. And the only way we found those is I started digging in the actual subdivision because the information was not provided to me. And that's what we're asking for on here. Just the information is on the original plat. The builder should have that. He should be able to provide that to us. It's a simple review by myself or Mr. Wood. Five minutes, we're not taking days to do this. They're so used to walking in with this all these years, which you can't read. I can't. Maybe some of y'all's eyes are young enough to do this. There's nothing on here that, that helps me review from a code standpoint. So all I'm asking for is a little better review of this and for them to provide us a site plan with the necessary information of that particular lot so that we can verify setbacks and easements and right of ways. Uh, utility locations that are causing the problems. Don't see it as a major cost effect to any of the builders. Sure, there's going to be some because they're going to have to provide me some pretty little pictures now. But other than that, that's about the extent of it. But I think in the long run, it's probably a cost saver and a time saver. 
from uh, the developer or builder standpoint. When you run into situations where you've told people they have to change the door because it doesn't comply, <laughs> or this window's got to be replaced because it's not safe to glass in the bathroom. So those things could have been called up front um, and um, saved the, the, the builder time of, of ordering that particular part, putting it in, and then finding out after the fact that it's got to be changed. So um, there's a little more up front, but in the long run, I think it's going to be a, a benefit for everybody. And the last thing I'd like to say about this is actually a, another way to assist the inspector so that he doesn't have to do this in the field. I'm able to review that, make the comments correct, and approve as noted, and then he's, he's that's one less thing he'll have to search for. When you answer my question, I'm going to answer it. You answer it. <laughs> oh, good. Any other questions, counsel? Okay, Thank for you. consensus yes, to I proceed. Think, I think it's a vote. Okay. Thank you, Robert. Uh, Thank you. I guess one last little item. We, I took the liberty of putting together a package that has been being handed out to all the developers and people to come in. So this will actually be emailed to our mail list and it will actually be available on the counter and mailed to every office. And this is basically what we just discussed. It's the, we just the breakdown of what we provide that to, to Ms. Warren so she can email it to all of us. Absolutely. So that we'll have it. Should it be put on the website in the it should be on their website. Yeah. It will be. Yeah. 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 Any place that a developer might look, we'll make sure this gets posted. Yes. That'll work. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you, Council. Thank y'all. Appreciate the work y'all are doing. And I'm glad y'all are busy. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Kilmore, is there anything under item three for items for review and discussion we need to address at this point? Okay. Thank you. Item four, council member items. Mr. Jackson? No, sir. Ms. Bonham Grace? Mr. King? Yes. Mr. Hunt? Yes. Thank you. Mr. Gilmore? Yes, just one quick thing. Uh, would like your concurrence. It's a standard practice we do, but we always come to you. We have an employee who is out on a workers' comp injury, and that employee has gone through his sick or annual leave. We would like your okay to advance 185 hours of sick leave. I mean, remember, we've done this before. Uh, as long as the employee's not on probation and that type of stuff. So your concurrence will proceed and have the standard agreement done. Everybody okay? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you all. Okay. Mm -hmm. Stop. Okay. Thank you. Item 5, our department head items from the Department of Finance and Administration. Ms. King? Nothing, sir. Thank you. From the Community Development. Anything further, Mr. Wood? Nothing further, sir. From Leisure Services, Mr. Dye. Saving my ammunition for tomorrow, sir. Okay. <laughs> and that's a good thing, right? <laughs> the answer is yes. He was bitter. Fire Emergency <laughs> Services, Chief Parker. Uh, yes, sir. Just uh, give you guys, uh, Mayor and Council, an update. If you didn't get my email today, just so you're all aware that we did complete the investigation on the uh, Terry FFA uh, pig barn uh, today and basically came to the conclusion that it, it is undetermined, the, the cause, but not ruling out the fact that it may have been a heat lamp that caused the, uh, the fire. But it is, I mean, it was too much destruction to actually determine anything, so we've called it undetermined. I just to make everybody aware of that. And we did have a, um, a state fire investigator offered his assistance. He came in from Eastman, helped out Chief Stanton on the fire. Both of them agreed on what the, that it was undetermined and that the cause could have been a, a heat lamp. So that's, that's what we determined. And Dr. Scott with the Board of Education has been notified as, as well as all of you folks through email. So any questions, I can answer those, but uh, that's pretty much it. That's all I have. Is there anything you have a for? Okay. <laughs>